you have the data with you so any point of time you can take it you can append it and you can start working the system is requiring the system is asking you to do that's where you're going to come into picture in terms of the system category factors typically a blackboard mechanism that's where you can you know typically print it across you can typically put it across to the client saying that this is what exactly we are doing this is how the data is getting passed Good morning and welcome to the first session in Unit 4, 5th semester BCA Software Engineering, where we're going to talk about architectural design. Now, this is a very important part of software engineering. Why? Because as an architectural design, you are going to construct the software. Now, when I use the word construct, that means to say that you have the priority, you have the option, you have the advantage and the technical knowledge to create exactly the components, exactly the software that is needed for the customer. So when you look into the architectural design definition from the IEEE standpoint, it says that process of defining collection of hardware and software components and their interfaces to establish the framework for the development of computer systems. So this is exactly where we are bringing in those words called as development and framework. So somewhere you are building the skeleton of the entire software and then go deep into it in terms of building up the entire system. Followed by which we are also going to understand the system category. Now system category is a component that consists of database, computational models that will perform function required by the system. So whatever the system is requiring, the system is asking you to do, that's where you're going to come into picture in terms of the system category factors. Now, what is the next thing? The set of connectors that will help in coordination, communication, cooperation between the components. So there needs to be an intermediate that will talk, that will communicate and that will put the system in place. Followed by which conditions that defines how computer systems can be integrated in the form of system. So that's also going to come into picture. It's very, very important for all of us to know. Semantic models that help the designer to understand overall properties of the system. Now that is also very, very important for all of us to know here. Why? Because these are all the models that are going to define the entire factor. Followed by which the use of architectural styles to establish a structure and component of the system. So this is going to be the entire big picture where we're going to connect everything and we're going to make a software design come in place. Now let's move further in order to understand the taxonomy. First one is a data centered architecture. A data store will reside at the center of this architecture. It is accessed frequently by other components that update or delete or modify the data present within the store. Now that is quite reasonable for us to understand why because this is exactly what we are looking into in terms of the communication factor. Followed by which we also want you to understand how does that typically illustrate, where does it come into picture in terms of understanding the repository, the various approaches that will be used in terms of the transformation when the data related to the client or the data interest that comes in change factor. Now what we are going to see here is that we are also going to understand that the data centered architecture will promote integrability which means to say that the integration component altogether. This means existing components can be changed. Why? Because if the client wants some change in the software, the client wants that there are some modifications to be bought in, there are some need factors that needs to be changed, the components that needs to be changed. Yes, that can be done. And we can add to the architecture without the permission or concern of other clients. So what I'm trying to do here is that I'm giving in a bit of flexibility inside the software where the concerned person 
person, the concerned architectural developer can start doing whatever he wants, wherever he wants to combine, bring in the best out of it and try to reallocate the system, remodule the system altogether. Data can be passed among the clients using blackboard mechanism. Now, when I say typically a blackboard mechanism, that's where you can, you know, typically print it across, you can typically put it across to the client saying that this is what exactly we are doing. This is how the data is getting passed from one part to another. So you have a complete picture of how the data is going to be published and put it across to the client. Followed by the advantages of a data center. The first thing is that repository of data is independent of client. So you don't have to worry about any clients. You don't have to worry about anybody coming to you and telling you that, so where is the data? Where is it located? Should I ask you 100 times? No, you don't have to. Why? Because you have the data with you. So any point of time, you can take it, you can append it, and you can start working. Followed by which the client work is independent of each other. So you are not dependent on anybody for your work. You can continue with it. And any simple additional features can be bought inside and modification is very, very easy. So this is a very big strategic advantage, I would like to say, in terms of a data centered model, because you will be able to run things by yourself. The data flow architecture. Now you might ask me, what is this kind of architecture all about? Now this kind of architecture is used when input data is transformed into output data through a series of computational manipulative components. So for example, when I'm going to talk about number games altogether, number games are very important. Why? Because if you see here, let's say that I'm going to give in data like this, where I'm going to put in some amount or I'm going to put in some values and that has to get transformed into some other output here and then it has to give a process or a feedback system here then what is happening is that this is a kind of input data getting processed step by step and coming to the next level altogether so at that point of time this kind of data flow architecture is going to be used which means the data is going to flow from one point to another point in a step-by-step -step method we're going to understand it and we're going to take it forward so that's where it makes a lot of difference here now in a data flow architecture each filter will be working independently and it is designed to take data input of a certain form and produces data output to the next filter in a specified form. Filters don't require any knowledge of working of neighboring files. Now this is exactly an advantage which I would like to say why because when you are inputting data in the form of numbers or in the form of alphabets, alphanumeric, whatever is that that's getting inside, it will automatically produce the output and the filters that they are going to use, it's not going to worry about the other files that are running through. So it will automatically go in for the transformation and you will get the respective output. The next thing is that when the data flow regenerates into single line of transform, it is termed as a batch sequential. So you go batch by batch in terms of processing. And this applies to a series of sequential components that are applied to transform it. So this is how you will see in a data flow architecture, you are going step by step, integrating the patterns, the system and moving from one end to the another end. Followed by what are the advantages of the data flow architecture. It encourages upkeep, repurposing and modification. Now in every factor, this modification and repurposing is going to play a very, very important role. With this design, concurrent execution is also supported. Now that is very important for all of us. Why? Because this will tell exactly how we need to take it up and how we need to go in terms of the design and the execution pattern. And it is always helpful. Why? Because you can upkeep and you can keep moving the data higher up again and again. So this will be of a great help to you altogether. Now, followed by which the disadvantage of data flow architecture is that it frequently degenerates to batch of sequential system. Now, that's one thing. Why? Because if a client is looking for multiple level of faster outputs, and that's going to get affected. Why? Because this is going to be a sequential generation. So at times you might see that the time consumption is higher and this does not allow applications with greater user engagement. So you're not going to bring in the user much into the picture. Why? Because this is only about one stream flow altogether. So the engagement level activity for a user is going to be on the lower side. And it's not easy to coordinate with two but related streams and that's also a problem because you can't have multiple flows coming inside. Now 
Call and return architecture. Now, this is the third kind of architecture that we are going to see. It is used to create a program that is easy to scale. That's the first thing that we are going to understand and modify. Many substyles exist within this category. Two of them are explained as below. Now, a remote call procedure architecture. Now, the first thing is that when I say call and return, because it has got the scalability, I can design, I can develop to whatever extent, modify it. Remote call procedure architecture, this uses to use the present into main program or sub program architecture. It is distributed among multiple computers on a network. So this is very, very important. Why? Because it is used in the main program or sub program and you can pull it back at any point of time. Now the main program sub program architectures are one that decomposes into number of sub programs or functions into a control hierarchy. Now that's very important because the main program contains number of sub programs or the components that are coming into picture. So all of these things will make a huge difference there. Now, the next thing is that object oriented architecture, which is even more the responsive and the most used kind of architectural design pattern. Now that must be applied to manipulate the data operation. In fact, the coordination and communication between components are established while the message is passing. So this is very, very important for all of us. Why? Because whenever you see that data, whenever it is happening all together, you will be able to understand that these are the communication factors, the way of understanding the protocol, the relationship between the components and the established factors of the messaging other things are well done here and you can encapsulate the data. It should be applied in such a manner that the communication is very clearly done so that you are able to get the respective output. Now, the characteristics of object-oriented architecture, they protect the system's integrity, no doubt about it. An object is unaware of the depiction of the other system. So definitely this gives you a stronger output, a stronger outhold altogether in terms of understanding how the system is working. And the most important thing is that for the advantageous factors enables a designer to separate challenge into a collection of autonomous. So you don't have to worry that there is a challenge standing, there is a question before me, but I can transform it to whatever I want altogether. And implementation of the object allowing changes to be made without having an impact on the other object. So this is very, very important. This is something that is needed for all of us to understand all together. So this is something which comes inside. Why? Because even without the, you know, the impact on other objects, without interfering kind of thing, it's allowing you to create the changes and you can continue designing the way you want it. The next one is going to be the layered architecture, which means it will have multiple layers for each and every operation. Every layer will do some kind of operation, become closely related to machine, and the instructions will continue to be in a progressive manner. At the outer layer, the components will receive the user interface. So outside, you will have a user interface where the consumer can start putting in the data, the user can. And then you have components inside which will take the data one by one so that the communication and coordination are taken step by step. Followed by which the advantage of this is that it will also give you a common example where you can see that the architectural flow is very common. You are able to connect. The communication is so well built that you are able to move forward from one point to another point. With this, I come to the end of today's session. I hope and believe that all the factors that we have spoken about in this section would be of a great help to you both in terms of theory as well as in practical walk of life. In the upcoming session, we would be talking about some more design patterns and the engineering concepts which would be of great help to you. But until then, stay tuned, stay blessed, have a great day. Thank you once again for joining me today on this great session.